greetings to all of you. My dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends, I will welcome to all of you from your pastor Yeti. I'm going to start part two in the portrait of a disciple and we have 14 descriptions that may help us better understand Jesus, the portrait of a disciple. So let's start with the first one. A person who is given by God. The disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is God's gift to his son. Jesus put it like this, I have revealed your name to the man you gave me. And I've said, how incredibly special indeed. We have taken a good look at this figure of the believer. What this means is simple. Every believer is a gift from God. Let me define what a gift is. Something given voluntarily or something bestowed or acquired without being sought after. God gave every believer as his gift to Jesus Christ. A gift is something special to both the giver of the gift and the receiver of the gift. It may be helpful to consider the radical change that takes place in the life of every disciple as God's special gift. The Christian disciple must have undergone a significant change of heart and life. If you just knew where I come from is a phrase often heard from people whose life have been radically altered or changed from where they first began. Corinth in the time of Paul was a busy city bound by every strain of sin imaginable. When the church was founded in that city, new believers had great difficulties in separating themselves from the world they had left behind. In Paul's letters to the church, this coming out from the world was presenting perhaps their greatest challenge as Christians. Evidently, not a great deal distinguished them from the world. The first epistle is fact, in fact, is really a treatise on the essentials of Christian discipleship. Consider some of the subjects addresses division, godly wisdom, boasting, immaturity, and this is in First Corinthians, um, humility, immorality, lawsuit among believers, and so on, so on. Paul addresses this issue in his second letter when he spoke to the matter of the ministry of reconciliation. From now on, he said, then we do not know anyone in a purely human way, even if we have known Christ in a purely human way. Yet now we no longer know him like that. And therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. All things have passed away. And look, new things have come. 2 Corinthians 5, 16-17 the implication here is that all believers are distinguished by a dramatic change caused by a radical difference between what they were in the world and what they have become out from the world. As the Son of Man spoke these things to the Father, the most important issues of change is set in motion. If the believer has been given from the world, then all the world has to offer has been put to death. This is why the believer becomes a new creation. The old has passed away and all things have become brand new under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul stresses this issue time without, without number to those who are placed under his pastoral change. Believers are, once again, given a reminder of the change that must be evident in the lives of those who have been given from out of the world. Someone has said that the greatest testimony for the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is a testimony of a changed life. 
One can argue and debate about every minute detail of the Christian faith, but no one can argue with the testimony of a changed life. So a person who is created with a purpose, another per view of a portrait of a disciple. If the cre if the sorry if the disciple is created with purpose, he becomes fused with God's intended plan for his life. Or facet. I mean, it's F U S E D. So it means the believer is characterized as one who is at all times under the constant guidance and direction of God. It must be so considering the extent to which all things are applied. The writer of Hebrews emphasizes these points when establishing the importance of running the race of life with endurance. The way the believer sticks to his guns and keeps on keeping on is by setting his sights on the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses around us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that it so easily ensnares us, and run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured a cross and despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. Hebrew 12, the verses 1 to 2. This passage brings two major issues to the surface concerning the extent to which all things reach in the heart of our Savior. Jesus is the source of salvation. This literally means He is the originator of salvation, not only because of His finished work on the cross, but because He is the preeminent example of our salvation. In other words, the disciple knows that everything about everything began with God. Jesus is the perfect of the perfecter of salvation. He is the finisher of salvation, not only because of his finished work on the cross, but because he is the only one authorized to bring us into heaven and complete our journey of faith. In this context, the term perfecter carries the idea of Jesus Christ having in the power and authority to carry through the perfect completion. Looking at it from the perspective of thanksgiving and prayer, which is surely an imperative for every believer, Paul says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. You can find this verse in the letters to the Philippians, chapter 1, verse 6. As he paints this picture of the believer, Jesus established the pattern of divine guidance, direction, and will in such a person's life. This is why Abram had such incredible faith when God came to him in Ur of Galdeans. The Lord said to Abraham, Go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house, to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt and all the peoples on earth. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 4. 
Abram's faith was pure in the purest sense. Note all the, the future tenses through the use of the empathy. I will, used repeatedly throughout this Abrahamic covenant. The pattern for Christian discipleship is firmly established right here in the story of Abraham because he did what God told him to do based on the belief that God controlled all things. Christian disciples, therefore, abdicate the right to control their own destiny. They simply submit in obedience to the will of a God who knows all things. 1 John 3.20 Jeremiah had this to say, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed is the Lord, who will be like a tree planted by water. It sets its roots out toward a stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes, and its foliage remains green. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit, Jeremiah 17, verse 7 and 8. In short, the disciple is a person who has absolute confidence in God's ability because he knows God is in control of all the affairs of man. Let's go a step further. A person who imitates Christ. The term disciple means to follow after. This is exactly what Jesus meant when he asked the twelve to follow him. Christian fellowship is much more than simply putting one foot ahead of another and getting in step with the one leading the pack. The leader, after all, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is perfect in every way. So the disciple has a tall order on his hands. Jesus is the ultimate example of selfless humility and expects his children to imitate his selfless example. Where this leaves us is made clear. So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to will and to act for his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world. Hold firmly the message of life. Then I can boast in the day that Christ that I didn't run in vain or labor for nothing. Philippians 2 verses 12 to 16. This is an interesting and an extremely challenging characteristic of a believer. Jesus established the basic premise of their active faith when he said, They have kept your word, John 17, 6. The word keep here refers to an essential character trait whereby the Christian purpose expresses a continued desire to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone asked you to keep your word about something you said or promised, she would be asking you to hold that word in sacred trust. In essence, you would be asked to imitate what you have said by carrying out what you have said. Probably one of the most sought of character traits or traits to be known as a person of your word. You not only say something, but you also adhere to what you say by doing what you say. In many regards, this amounts to the highest calling of the believer. This is what the Ephesian Christians heard about the subject. Therefore, be imitators of God, dearly loved children, and walk in love, as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragment offering to God. And you can read that verse in Ephesians 5, the verses 1 to, to 5. As we will see later on, this is the 
purpose of sanctification. The genuineness of the disciple is evidenced by the fact that he or she becomes more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the word of God is being held kept in the heart and manifest in actions. This is a functional part of the design of the Christian life. And remember the word, if you start reading the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. The word is the Lord Jesus Christ. The end results in the gradual and progressive production of Godlines in the life of every believer. Believers are to become more and more like their Heavenly Father as they keep His Word and imitate what it He teaches. The end product of keeping His Word is clearly stated in Ephesians 3, 16 and 19. I pray that He may grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the bread and white, height and depth, and to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge, so you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The list is really endless when it comes to imitating God by keeping His word. Such is the portrait of the disciple. Believers keep God's word. They obey it, long for it, learn from it, practice it. In so doing, they become imitators of the Lord Jesus Christ with all the benefits pertaining thereto. And I'm going to stop part two here. Remember the last beautiful words we hear in the prayer that Paul reached out to his Lord Jesus. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I will encourage you, my dear ones, to read this prayer in Ephesians 3, 16 to 19 on a regular basis. It is such a very deep prayer. But we pray for each other, that we bring people to God's heart and coming to an understanding, compassion of God, the comfort of God, the God that is all in all. My dear ones, this is the end of part two. So tomorrow we're going to do part three in the portrait of a disciple. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. This is your Pastor Yeti. I love you guys. Bye. Thank you.